Welcome SEO survivors, it's me GamerTurk and today we're gonna look into a developer update for Sword Online Fractured Daydream that was released earlier today. This was the Japanese website, I was willing to go over the machine translated versions via Google Chrome, but luckily Bandai Namco Europe has published the entire developer update on their own website, properly translated as well. This is probably gonna get published on the US site later today as well, but you know, time zone differences, it happens. So, as you recall, Sword Online Fractured Daydream had its closed beta a couple of weeks ago. I had an immense amount of fun. I have an entire ultimate review on my beta experiences, which you should check after watching this one. But today, the point here is look at what they are changing based on the feedback they have received in the Fractured Daydream closed beta. And after going through all of these, I will also have a Q&A section with you guys reading from the chat. Hello there everyone, welcome, welcome, good to have you all around. But that's gonna be after going through the entire thing because I want to clip this and put it on my channel as an update thingy as well without the Q&A section. So, without further ado, let's go in. Start online, Fractured Daydream, notification of closed beta improvements. Thank you for participating and they had a survey but I don't think the Western side properly received it. I, I let Bandai Namco Germany know as well because they sent me a custom link for me to be able to actually access it. If they sent a newsletter, I did not receive it despite having been registered for it. So this may be predominantly well dominated by the feedback on the Japanese side. I don't know about the other regions at the moment. Anyways, first feedback is about the core of the combat. Actually, let me switch over to the other thing as well. I added a lot of fancy stuff in preparation for this stream. Finally learning how to stream stuff properly after five, six years of experience in this one. Good job, Gamer Turk. Anyways, the first one is about an attack cancel mechanic. You will, well, I personally, love this one from the memory defrag days all the way back because this makes the entire combat feel more fluid if you can react things immediately as they happen. The thing is there is a neat balance to be struck in between. If you can cancel every single attack there is no more risk and reward in regards to those charging attacks or long commitment attacks and that is exactly what they are referring to here. They have actually discussed it in their internal meetings and checked what they can do. And what they decided was they are basically adding a cancel mechanic via the dodge to the basic attacks. You can cancel out of your basic attacks quite swiftly. However, with those longer commitment attacks that require a dash or a charge, you won't be able to cancel out of those. You need to consider that risk and reward basically. This is a completely understandable thing and adding the cancel mechanic to basic attacks for that fluidity really helps a lot. In fact, this is something Variant Showdown absolutely should copy over for themselves as well, which I believe they will. They never went into detail in their own developer updates in terms of combat, but this video is about the Fractured Daydream, not about Variant Showdown. We'll talk about that in the monthly Dead Game Report after the switch of the month into May. So again, cancel mechanic, thank you very much, nice addition. Lock-on mechanic is hard to use was one of the key feedbacks they had received, which I completely agree with. I had a bunch of issues on that front as well. In fact, in my live streams, you have also seen me struggle with the relatively randomness of the lock-on as well. And I really liked what they did here. I think they were really creative. They approached it from a little bit outside of the box and found some creative solutions into the camera problems. So first off, we received many comments and requests about the lock-on mechanic. We'll implement the following adjustments. First off, the lock-on distance is being extended. Even in the small boss room of Ilfang, the moment Ilfang moved a little bit too much, your lock-on was immediately cut off. This is a very good decision, you will be more reliably able to lock on enemies. However, I believe they mentioned it somewhere, but they still have a distance cutoff. So in larger areas or larger rooms, for example, the Skull Reaper boss room, if the boss still moves around way too much, you will get cut off and you will need to reorient yourself. However, with that extended distance, this should be a lot more reliable. The lock on target will be adjusted to consider not only the distance to the center of the screen, so 
your exact vision on your screen, but also the distance between itself and the target. So a closer enemy, even if it's towards the peripheral vision a little bit, will be prioritized over the farther away enemy from you. Good change. Adjust the controls to switch between targets when using the lock-on and this is what I meant by being creative and a really good solution. If you pull the right stick up, this will automatically prioritize locking onto the boss or other MVP enemies and if you pull the right stick down, it will instead lock on to the closest enemy for you to immediately engage with them and attack. And otherwise, you can still use left and right to cycle through enemies normally as it was in the beta. These two camera additions with the stick right up and stick down, these are great ones that will make it... Well, they are saying it themselves. They, it will make it easier to move the lock-on cursor to target the desired enemy. Completely agree. Great addition on this one. Add a feature to release the lock-on automatically to prevent the camera from moving wildly when the target boss moves out of the screen at high speeds. I think this is primarily in the case of those lunging targets or Ilfang boss room still comes into my mind where there are a lot of other enemies around and if your target lock-on expires, if the enemy is too far away, you'll immediately lock on to a seemingly random target on the screen making you require you to reorient yourself. That is no longer going to be the case from what I'm understanding. It will just release the lock instead of targeting another random enemy and you will need to target a new enemy instead yourself. The choice wasn't particularly a big issue for me but again improvement is an improvement. Adjust the lock-on feature to allow only its release within the targeting range of bosses. This is a countermeasure to avoid targeting issues when the character rotates around large enemies. What now? Adjust the lock-on feature to only allow its release within the targeting range of the bosses. It's a countermeasure to avoid targeting issues when the character rotates around large enemies. I do not seem to understand what this exactly means. I remember this sentence, the <laughs> Japanese one as well. I was hoping the English version would be a little bit more descriptive. Uh, compared to the machine translated one, but I'm not sure what this specific point does. Either way, this one is about the matchmaking. I can't select my favorite character, which is a limitation within your own party. If you remember, the game features 20 player co-op that consists of 5 parties consisting of 4 individual people. Now, usually you won't get into a lot of troubles because the character restrictions you cannot pick the same two characters within a given party of four. You can still have five Kiritos in, the, in that 20 player room. Each five party can have one Kirito each. However, you can't have two Kiritos in a single party of four. If you're unlucky enough with the matchmaking, you can end up having four Kirito main players within the same four person party. This was particularly the case in the beta itself where, you know, we had a lower amount of characters available to select from. Luckily, in the full release, the matchmaking will actually take into account your pre-picked favorite character. If you had played the beta and tinkered around a bit, there was a feature to select your favorite or, or preferred character. The matchmaking will take that into account. And for example, if you're an Argo main like me, who picked Argo as the favorite character, the matchmaking will try to make sure that if there's another Argo favorite character in the 20 player lobby, they will be put into a different party than you, so both of you can still pick Argo. This is a very nice change as a result. A system of the character selection screen where all scheduled to be modified, okay, but the details of it have not been finalized this time and will be announced later, that is neat. The total number of characters will also be increased in the game's final version, so the distribution should be better than the closed... Oh yeah, that's basically what I said at the very beginning, that the issue we had in the beta will already be mostly alleviated by the fact that we will have more than 20 characters to pick. Now, this is the real tragedy. The sound of stamp being spammed distracts from the game. This was one of the most fun things in the beta in my opinion, and um, I, I felt like most people agreed, where especially after defeating a boss, after completing a challenge or something, which was defeating bosses in the in the beta experience, everyone just kept spamming those emotes back to back to back to back to back. 
Which is, in my opinion, just fine. That we're all celebrating, we're mindlessly spamming. So I'm, I agree to a certain bit that if someone is constantly spamming emotes during the main part of the game itself, that is extremely distracting. So I completely understand where this decision has come from. But as I tweeted earlier today, I would strongly urge the developers to consider removing the limit after a boss has been defeated. We stay around 20 seconds after the defeat of the boss in the lobby as well with everyone else and everyone just wants to celebrate in those 20 seconds. So once a boss is defeated, once the mission is completely complete, just let everyone spam emotes again. I, I feel like that's a good compromise. I know where this de decision comes from. It is a reasonable decision as well, but make a distinction between the actual game and a 20 second celebration period, you know, I, I feel like that is a reasonable request coming from the player side as well because spamming emotes, it is one of the main ways people express themselves and this should be a celebration at the end of the boss fights, I think we can all agree on that. Now, another part of feedback was that there are too few recovery crystals. We always started with three recovery crystals and these never refreshed. So if you used your recovery crystals until you despawned and respawned, you wouldn't get new recovery crystals to replenish your health in any way possible. And if you did not have a healer at all, in longer parts of content, this could become a particular grievance in that sense. So they are addressing that part of the feedback. They are placing these goddess statues around the map, uh, particularly before boss encounters, that will replenish your health crystals so you can go into that new challenge with at least three recovery crystals again. I think this is a good compromise. I think this is a good choice. And they're also modifying how it works. I, I was guilty of this quite a bit as well during the beta, is that you will no longer be able to use recovery crystals if your HP was already full. Thank you, because as I was trying to get used to the button mapping of the game, way too many times I accidentally used a recovery crystal while trying to use one of my skills and completely wasted it because my HP was already full. So thank you very much, Bandai Namco, for giving me a nice little safety net. Moving on, adjustments to the revival mechanic. In fact, I remember this was a particular issue in Fatal Bullet as well as we were doing some Fatal Bullet streams over the past couple weekends with uh, Scrambled, Shadow, Easy, Truth, uh, everyone else, that in this gameplay engine when we try to revive others the littlest contact would make you stagger and completely block off the revival attempt you would need to reinitiate re it but during the time you were staggered the time was already moving and the person who you were trying to revive would probably just burst into polygons instead by the time you recovered from that stagger. They are adjusting that. I think it's a little bit of a too heavy-handed measure. Let me read that first. The risks and benefits of using the revival mechanic are not well balanced, so we'll implement the following adjustments. Add super armor to the players performing a revival so that the process will not be interrupted if they receive an attack before the countdown reaches zero. Please note that the revival will not be interrupted when attacked, but the players will still receive damage. Super armor was, of course, the clear solution on this front. However, in my opinion, just a blanket super armor could be a little too much. I think a little bit more of a nuance, if possible, within the system would be more appreciated, where lighter attacks from enemies won't stagger you. However, if the enemy is charging at you full force with some huge super attack of some sorts, then yes, maybe that should be able to interrupt your revive. It, it is frustrating, but it is still part of that risk and reward gameplay format. You know, there's, I think a little bit more of a nuanced balancing approach here would benefit the tactical nature of the game overall. On that note, actually, the tactical nature, yes, because if there are hard-hitting enemies that would then be able to break off your revive, well, maybe then you would want to bring a tank character to pull the aggro away. There are more meaningful decisions to make. You know what I'm getting at, right? If you had a blanket super armor, everyone can just haphazardly go in and, and revive, even if the situation obviously should not be allowing it. That is my point. A little bit more of a balancing to make that a decision, something to something to engage your brain, whether you should or shouldn't, it would be a nice little appreciated thing. Additionally, however, these are things I like. A recovery item will be dropped after successfully completing a revival to reward the player who took the risk to revive a fellow team member. 
See, they even use the word there, risk. So, in terms of that super armor, please make sure there is still a risk. The way you did it minimizes the risk a little too much. However, giving the person a benefit from actually helping a teammate, this is great. This is a good choice that will encourage more players to actually pay attention to the battle overall that's happening around them. Having down team members that could not be revived laying around when a mission is cleared can make it seem as if they lost. So all the down teammates will now be revived automatically after completing a mission. This sounds like very much an edge case. If I remember correctly, I may be remembering it wrong, but if you died and the mission was completed, I think during the Ilfang fight, you were basically teleported outside of the boss room and you couldn't get back in. I think this is more of a patchwork to avoid that from happening. Next part of feedback. It's hard to see the difference between the characters' roles. I, I partially agree with that statement because <laughs> if you watched us playing the beta or played the beta yourself, Leafa was a support character, but Leafa also had an incredible damage potential and Scrambled was, if focusing on attack, was quite regularly topping the leaderboards with the support character that he was as Leafa. So I think this is an, a nice choice that they have done here to differentiate the specific roles a little bit more. Fighter and Rogue characters, these are your DPS attack characters, so they are receiving a little bit of a power boost to their basic attacks, not skills, just the basic attacks. The support type will receive increased recovery buffs and decreased power of their base attacks, so Leafa will likely no longer be topping those DPS charts. Uh, kind of sad, but yeah, reasonable, normal, understandable. And increasing the recovery of the buffs, fine. As long as it doesn't make things too easy. I think Leafa's heal was fine during the beta, but hey, if they saw this as a need, then yeah, sure, let's see how it goes. Tank enhanced blocking actions, which I don't think many people were using at all. The parrying mechanic was a little bit too much overshadowed by other stuff. It was a very much action-based game, so everyone was just attack, 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 or dodge. I don't think anyone was using the parry skills. So this is a good choice. And increase the aggro generated by taunts. This is also a good choice. I don't think Agil was as effective as they intended him to be in the beta. They'll also do separate adjustments on a character basis, not just class basis, but their plan is to implement the above mentioned adjustments evenly according to the roles themselves. Now, regarding the ally NPC behavior, <laughs> this was already known. This was the main feedback back during Fatal Bullet as well, and it remained to be the main feedback during the closed beta of Fractured Daydream 2 and they recognized how the NPC allies were absolutely useless at reviving teammates and during the beta they had already recognized why this behavior was happening, why they were not going for revives when teammates needed it, but they couldn't make it, they couldn't have the fix during the beta period itself, but they said they would fix it and here again saying yeah this is gonna be fixed during the main release, not a surprise here improve upon the issue where the NPC characters do not confront the enemies when the player is attacking from a long distance. Uh, this feels very much like a Shinon main issue. A nice fix, appreciate it. I'm not a Shinon player, but the huge amount of Shinon players who are playing as Shinon, as shown by the stats of the official accounts, I'm sure they will actually be happy. Controller button configuration. Uh, they're saying they will add different control types. We received some comments from players mentioning that they want to option to configure the controls freely. However, we'll continue to evaluate this option. From what I'm understanding here, they are just adding presets at the moment. They said people want to be able to do this freely, but that they will continue to evaluate the option. So that doesn't sound like they are giving us a way to freely map our buttons. I say this towards every single game, whether it's a Start Online, whether it's Final Fantasy, whether it's uh, Genshin Impact. I do not appreciate it when every single game I play have pretty much exactly the same action types, however require a completely different muscle memory to be able to play. I can't even switch between Final Fantasy 7 and 16. I don't like that. Give me the option to freely map my buttons. I don't think that is rocket science. Uh, yes, it may have a small amount of usage, but, but, but please, please let me use the same muscle memory I have from any other game I play. Now, that would be greatly appreciated. Moving on, Synchro Counters will extend the reaction range for this 
mechanic, adjustments to the difficulty of the synchro counter itself. We received mixed opinions about this mechanic. Some players found it easy to use, while others considered it hard to use. We believe that it'll become easier for the players to use this mechanic successfully as they become used to it, so we decided to discard doing any adjustments for now. However, this does not mean we'll not do any adjustments to it at all. We'll continue to do any necessary adjustments based on the feedback received after the game's official release. I completely agree with what they said here. The reason why some people found synchro counters quite hard to pull off, there was actually two reasons. One, people were not used to it and were not seeing it right away when they needed to go to take their place for that synchro counter. So the players themselves were not used to it and were often too late to participate. And secondly, the amount of NPC characters, NPC partners only joined up on the synchro counter after a party member joins it as well. So if the player in the party was already too late, well, the NPC character would be even later to the task. And as a result, people wouldn't be able to pull the synchro counter off. I completely agree with it, as people get more used to the patterns and when to go for those synchro counters, I think this is going to be completely, should I say completely, 99% alleviated once people get used to the mechanic on that front, and especially in larger player field lobbies rather than NPCs, I think this is already not a problem at all. During the final two days of the beta, I could pull off synchro counters quite reliably, and a bunch of times we even pulled off perfect synchro counters as well, which is quite satisfying. So yeah, I completely agree with them. I don't think this is an issue, and I think as people get more used to the game, this will be completely fixed. They may want to look at the NPC's participation in the synchro counter though. I think lowering that delay of the NPC players actually participating could do some nice additional wonders on this front. Moving over to some final minor feedback. Adjust the parameters for special effects of the equipment. I think this refers to the individual perks and their percentages. That is quite vague on its own. Improvements to make it easier to equip unequip accessories. I think it was impossible to unequip accessory. <laughs> I think this may be referring to that. You could replace an accessory with another accessory. However, you could not remove it and leave that slot empty. I may just not have found a way to do it, but hey, that means it was hard to do and I appreciate making it easier to do that. It's hard to see the notifications when a team member is down, adjust the font and size of the text. I, I actually agree with this one, especially if someone what was not directly in your field of view, it was borderline impossible to recognize that they were dead. So giving it a, a better kind of a notification, good choice. Adjust the difficulty of the tower missions when playing with NPCs. I think there are some changes they can do when playing with players as well, like some global changes, which I went into in my uh, closed beta ultimate review extensively. I think the tower mission needs a little bit more of that fine tuning on, on a global scale rather than just with NPCs. Although I agree, do, trying to do it with NPCs was much worse. So thank you for adjusting the difficulty when playing with NPCs. However, the overall balancing could still benefit from a little look. And correction of some effects that are hard to distinguish. Well, sure, sure. The scope of that note is also hard to distinguish, so I'll, I'll take that as a win. But that is pretty much every single change that they have mentioned in the developer update. So with that, I am switching to my other scene and we'll do a final little Q&A section. Hello there chat, sorry for not looking at it at all since the beginning of the stream. However, I plan to clip this out and make it a separate video available on the channel, which is why I left the Q&A section at the very end. From here onwards, I am actually reading the chat. Hello there truth, how you doing? 